welcome to our discussion today on venomous foes that started out as spiders and snakes, but you guys have sent me pictures and you've had so many questions even before the event that we've extended that out to ticks and also scorpions. So we're excited about today. We hope that you're ready as well. My name is Holly Foxworth. I'm a registered nurse and the content marketing uh, manager for um, content marketing manager. We'll get there one of these days today um, here at Axiom. And I'm also joined by a fantastic panel. We have Dr. Cherry, who is our chief uh, medical officer. And then we also have our CMO, Dara Wheeler. She's our chief marketing officer. And we will have both of them. We'll let you um, meet both of them here momentarily. But before we get started, just give you an idea of what you're looking at here on your screen. There's three places that you're probably going to spend the most of your time in addition to watching what's right there in the middle of your screen. So the first one is at the top of the box. That's the one that you're gonna press and it just says register now. That is for our next webinar this next month, which is gonna be on the 13th, so July 13th at one o'clock. And that is the, um, the destruction and the devastating impact of migraine disease. Um, just a quick note on that. I don't know how, how much you guys are aware of that, but um, migraine illness is affecting one in six. And I had no idea that it was the leading cause of disability in those under the age of 50. So we're going to be going through that, going through some of the triggers, identifying those, looking at what it is that you can do, how you can appropriately manage that, some workplace accommodations, um, and how it is that, that you can... Um, take care of your employees. So whether you have migraines, whether you think that, that some of your staff may have them, obviously with one in six, that's likely the case. And so we hope that you will join us for that. Again, all you have to do is press that button that says register now and that will get you reserve your seat. There's nothing more that you need to do. Right below that is where we we hope you spend the most of your time. And that is our Q&A box. That's where if you love to get gifts, that is where you need to be. Um, we have, we always send out great gifts, but we even have some, I think, correct me if I'm wrong there, but we have some scorpion tattoos that tattoos and stickers that we had made for this event. Exactly. Yeah, Darren, Holly. yeah. Was that it? Yeah. Yes. So we love all of our participants and all the Q and a we get, we get lots of great questions from all of you. Um, we reward you for those questions. Um, Holly sends out some really fun stuff and some nice notes, but we did have some um, disturbing and fun scorpion tattoos <laughs> made and stickers made for this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's so near and dear to my heart in a little bit. Yeah, we got some great stories today. Uh, so all you need to do is just, if you have a comment, if you have a question, whatever it is that you want to put in that box, if you'll just type that in and it sends it our way. We like to take those questions while we're having the event. Um, it, it seems to make things go a little bit easier and it can, kind of keeps that conversation flowing. So please put in those questions as soon as they, they come to your mind, but we definitely want to hear them and, and we'll also send you a love note afterwards. And the one right below that is your resource section. That is where you can get a copy of today's slides. Um, so you can download there. I think we also have some blogs that have some additional information there as well. So those are the three places that you may spend the most of your time with the one being the most important, the question and answer box. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Let's have you uh, meet our panel, which includes Dr. Sherry and Dara, as I've mentioned, but I'll let them introduce themselves and say hello before we get started. Dara, do you want to go first? I'd love to. Thanks, Holly. Uh, my name is Dara Wheeler. I'm Axiom's Chief Marketing Officer. I've been with Axiom for 17 years. And um, we'll talk, like I said, a little bit about why this topic is important to me. But it is something that over the years that you um, hear various stories from our clients, we always have some really interesting ones out there in the field of um, employees dealing with stings, bites, and all the interesting things out there. So um, I know Dr. Cherry and I are Looking forward to talking about this topic and how to handle it. Awesome. Dr. Cherry? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Cherry. I'm Axiom Medical's Chief uh, Medical Officer. I'm a preventive medicine and occupational medicine uh, board certified physician. Um, I've been with Axiom uh, a little bit over five years now, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Awesome. Fantastic. And it looks like we got our first question. This one was from Heidi was asking about the migraine webinar and was asking if we'd touch on cluster headaches. And yes, Heidi, we will touch on cluster headaches. So we hope to see you there. All right. So just to give you an idea of what we're going to go through today, we're going to go through some of the risk for getting bit, 
what it is, how it is that you can identify some of those, what to do if you're bitten, um, where and when to seek treatment, some of those dangerous myths to avoid. I think that's my favorite part sometimes talking about some of the, the myths that go around. Some of the best practices for preventing exposure and then also we're going to get into the ticks and scorpions. So before I turn it over to Darren to get us kicked off, I do want to um, send a special thanks. And this one, actually, this was an image that came to us from John Gotzel and from Cactus Wellhead. And so he sent us this picture of the scorpion on some of their equipment. And he was mentioned it looked like a mama and she had her babies on there. She looked kind of angry. So these are exactly the types of, of animals that we'll be going through today. And we hope that you don't see one of these little jewels in um, the next cabinet that you open or the stairwell that you walk into. So Derek, get us started and talk to us about the risk of, of some of the venomous bites. Yeah, thanks Holly. Um, and thank you for sending that picture. Um, our clients do always like to send some interesting stuff our way. Uh, so thank you for sending that on. We um, in the US see okay. about seven to 8,000 venomous bites per year. Um, and this is snake and spider. Um, although fatality is rare, uh, there are, even if it is a, a low risk of fatality, there are some potentially serious risks of symptoms and things needing medical treatment um, and making sure that we get our workers that are out there taken care of. Um, and there can be some uh, injuries and longer lasting uh, disabilities. We do know Although we do see a lot of the stats around the snake bites out there, spider bites often get very underreported because people either don't know that they've been bitten by a spider, the stats are a little bit less reliable than snakes typically um, because they're just not reported or detected. And so that's something that to keep in mind as we talk through these, these numbers, um, people often get spider bites and don't necessarily realize what they are until there's a problem. Yeah. Scott, I'll come to you next. Kind of talk us through some of these snakes. You know, we, we feel like that there's a lot of snakes that are out there, but there's several that that need to be kind of at the top of our list on, on what it is that we're looking for um, that can cause a problem. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, what you see here on the slide is the four most common uh, snakes that are um, pertinent for North America. And, and so um, starting out with copperheads, they're found really kind of in grass, dirt, or where they... Um, where prey they may, uh, um, the prey that they actually will seek out. And they're usually really not in populated areas. However, as uh, more and more humans take over uh, wild, wilder areas, and uh, you'll, you'll actually see them now in urban environments. And so, um, you know, at, at one point it, it was really uncommon to find them in um, populated areas, but, but now I think it's gonna become potentially more common. Um, and their skin really has broad, alternating dark and light patterns that resemble hourglasses. So that's kind of a way to help differentiate it. Um, the next one is the cottonmouth, which is found in and uh, near water. And uh, they're usually dark brown with light brown and dark brown patterns. Um, and from their namesake, when they're threatened, they'll open their mouth, revealing a white interior. Um, you know, rattlesnakes are quite varied. Um, and they're really found uh, in many places with many different looks. And really the easiest thing um, based on their name is really the rattle at the tip of their tails, which can differentiate them from other, um, uh, other snakes that we were talking about today. And then lastly, the coral snake, uh, um, usually found in forest canyons or coastal plains. They're very slender and relatively short, um, usually two and a half feet or less. And they're very colorful, uh, black uh, with yellow and red rings. And um, the last two, the rattlesnake and coral snakes, um, what's interesting about them is that they their venom is a neurotoxin. Um, so it, it can affect um, our motor control of, um, uh, of our muscles. And um, the first two copperheads and cottonmouths actually have a, a hemotoxic venom, which is really a, a venom that can disrupt our blood, our ability to clot. And so you see really massive bleeding, um, platelets go very low. Platelets are what help us clot um, when there's some kind of injury. And so um, it's very interesting that they have different types of venom. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Glade actually had asked a question. Um, Dr. Cherry was asking which rattlesnake bites or venom are the most potent. Do you know that? Which rattlesnakes? That's what the question said. Yeah, it says um, mm. which rattlesnakes. Um, yeah, and then Patrick was asking, are the young rattlesnakes, the ones that don't have rattles um, developed yet, are they just as dangerous? You know, um, I've I've heard anecdotally, like the the younger snakes sometimes are more dangerous because they can't control their venom. So they may actually mm-hmm. give, um, during a bite, uh, inject all of their venom. Uh, I'm not quite sure about uh, when a rattlesnake will actually develop its rattles. Uh, I think um, it's potentially from as they're uh, shedding their scales, the old scales may turn into the rattles, but um, that's a, uh, I'm not 100% certain about that. Okay. And then talk to us about the, the characteristics um, that may be a little bit specific that they could identify. Um, sure. these. I know you had sure. mentioned kind of the head before, but if you can kind of yeah. go you know, so they really kind of have like cat-like eyes with thin black vertical uh, vertical pupils, um, and then uh, the pit vipers have this triangular sh- uh, shaped heads with holes behind the eyes to detect prey, um, with thick bodies and heads and a neck that narrows at the skull of the base, um, mm. and they have um, hollow fangs that rotate forward during um, during striking. So. Um, again, you know, it's somewhat nice that we only have to deal roughly with four types of snakes in North America, but, um, you know, it's still a very, um, it's a tough predicament if you get, if you get bitten, you really want to try to take a picture if, uh, or if, uh, you know, you want to be as safe as possible to really, um, it, in the time of emergency, trying to remember the different descriptions. I mean, if you're in a certain area that's known for a specific type of snake and you're well-versed in it, that's one thing. But if you're really new to this, it, it, it really beholds you to get a picture of the snake if you ha- aren't able to kill it necessarily and, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we had several other questions that came in. Um, Dr. Cherry, one was asking, um, Daryl was asking, or actually, Daryl mentioned that the eastern diamondback is the is the most venomous rattlesnake. The other, hmm. Tanya was asking, is there a way to tell if um, if a snake is venomous just by, I guess, by just looking at them or by looking at what the bite was? Do you have any idea on that? Um, you, you know, so the four snakes we're talking about here are the four most common venomous snakes in North America. So most others would be non-venomous, but that's a little bit uh, precarious to have a rule of thumb. And so you yeah. do want to get, you know, um, good advice on what to do with a snake bite by a professional. But again, these are the four most common and pertinent ones for North America. Yeah. Scott, I, I like your advice too about knowing what is local. So, you know, yeah. in, in yeah. the Houston area, if you know you're going to be out in the woods in the Houston area, mm-hmm. take some time to educate yourself about what those snakes mm-hmm. might look like so that if you do come across one you or you do get bitten, you know, um, kind mm-hmm. of what they look like, because I do, I, somebody even asked, I think in the chat, whether they're, how to tell the difference between um, a coral snake, let's see, well, and a scarlet king snake. So, you know, there mm-hmm. are a lot of snakes that look very similar. One is venomous, one is not. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people see king snakes and they think that they're, they're venomous, they get really worried and really they're mm-hmm. a benign, really good snake to have around because they're, they're killing off rodents or different things. Mm-hmm. And so, um, there's no, uh, unless you're an expert, of course, there's not always a, a great way to do it other than to just educate yourself and learn about the different types of snakes that you might encounter in your area. Um, mm-hmm. And then if you do happen to be bitten, like Scott said, if you can get a picture or you can, if you haven't been able to kill the snake, we'll talk a little bit about what to do if bitten, but mm-hmm. those are really great tips, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, Glade was asking again, um, had said, so which one is it? Do we know which one is most potent, whether it be the sidewinder, the East Timber Rattler, et cetera? We may need to look. We may need to look. Yeah, I, that I don't up. have that information at, okay. at my fingertips right now. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, good deal. These are great questions that are coming mm -hmm. in, really good ones. And Mary, you hit the nail on the head. We're going to get to that soon. But Mary said, and don't take the live snake to the ER. That's exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> Don't take it to the ER, but we're going to get into to what to do. Yeah. All right. Let's talk through then um, some of the spiders that cause issues. I know that this one is, it may not be as intimidating to look at, but but some of the bites are, are just as significant. Um, Let's say, uh, Scott, do you want to start here with some of the sure. um, some of the spiders? Yeah. Yep. So these two are really the most common in North America for spiders. So you have the brown recluse and uh, black widow. Uh, the brown recluses are singularly brown with uh, without really any bands, modeling, or stripes, um, but they do have that um, classic violin shape mark um, on their kind of. Uh, it's called cephalothorax, really, like the head and neck part of the body, which the legs attach to. Um, they are kind of known for their unusual eyes, while most spiders have eyes uh, arranged in rows of four. Um, these recluses have uh, six equal sized eyes arranged in three pairs. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of a mouthful, but they do have this unique look um, with, with these unusual eyes. Um, now we, when we look at the black widows, you know, these are shiny black with the bright red and orange hourglass shaped markings on the underside um, of their round abdomen. And they have eight eyes arranged in two rows. So, um, you know, these are really the, the two most common things we have to be uh, on the lookout for um, here in North America. Yeah. Some of these comments that are coming in are just, they're awesome. <laughs> Some of the sayings that they have, Tanya had said, let's see, they hide underneath pools. Yes, you're exactly right. First Johnson said, red touch black good for Jack red touch yellow kill a fellow. And then Ronnie said, red and yellow kill a fellow, red and black friend of Jack. So lots of good yeah lots of good tips then on how you can remember some of those yeah mm -hmm. all right let's see there was also one um as the amount of black widows are increasing are they killing let's see killing off the black widows and are we seeing an increase in the amounts of bites scott do you know the answer to that with the the brown recluse are killing off some of the black widows I've that heard I, that. I'm, I'm not familiar with um and i haven't looked at our uh aggregate data for this year for um, insect uh, or um, spider bites uh, for the year. But I know it's going to be ramping up now in the summertime. Mm -hmm, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's talk about what to do if you're bit. And we're going to come back to some of these questions. We haven't forgotten about them because they're so so good here. Um, but I'll come to, to both of you and let's kind of talk about what it is that we need to do if we get bit. Dara, do you want to start here and and does take yeah, it from there. Uh, as a couple of you pointed out, do not bring the venomous snake with you to the emergency room, please. Um, it, if you, again, before you go out, before you're out in, a, in an area where you might be bitten by a snake or a spider, make sure you've done some research and you know a little bit about what's in your area. Um, identifying the source is important because that will aid in treatment. If the emergency room or the, the physicians that are working with you don't know what has happened or what you've been bitten by, they are very limited in, in what they can do to support you from a, a, an anti-venom or a managing your symptom standpoint. Um, so take pictures, if it's safe to take pictures, mm -hmm. if not, um, you know, just try to note the coloration, the face, the, you know, if you're if the spider, um, what type of spider it looks like and make sure you try to in the midst of you know your panic and stress in the moment of being bitten um, or stung just make sure that you try to note as much as possible the characteristics of what bit you mm -hmm. scott um, if you want to jump into some of the quick treatments sure you know and um i think you had a great segue there where this is a very uh, anxiety inducing uh, event but you do want to try to stay as careful as possible the more amped up you get it if it is a venomous bite, um, the more amped up you are, the, the faster your blood is pumping. And so it does kind of, you know, help move along the venom to different areas. So um, I guess it's probably a good life, um, a life motto, but, uh, you know, that's, that's hard to implement 100% of the time. But definitely here, you want to try to be as um, 
calm as possible. If you do get bit, you don't want to be running uh, back to your truck or vehicle, things like that. Um, but again, you do want to quickly try to get your mind uh, focused on what this potentially was. And if you can take a picture of it, that's really helpful. Um, and then classic wound care um, is always um, important. So wash the area with soap and water, um, even if it's relatively a clean uh, bite or area. Um, and then you do want to keep the wound relatively immobilized. The more motion, if it's across a joint, um, the more motion, again, is going to help um, distribute the, the venom um, into the body quicker. Um, and then to obviously elevate the limb uh, to the heart level so that way you don't have the, the blood draining into the limb uh, through the venous pathways. Um, and then like we talked about with some of the toxins in the venom, you may have you know significant swelling. So you definitely wanna take off rings and watches um, or any kind of tight clothing uh, specifically so that, that way they don't have to be cut off in the ER. <laughs> um, Dr. Cherry, we did have a a quick question here from Steve. Uh, would being on a baby aspirin per day increase issues of bitten by a snake with venom mm. that affects platelets? Um, you know, so there was a recommendation for like a baby aspirin daily for either prevention of like uh, cardiovascular disease or if you've had a heart attack, um, potentially people are on it. And um, uh, from... As, as I recall, um, I don't believe there's a significant bleeding risk, or at least it does not lower your platelets. I, if we're worried about those uh, hemotoxic um, venoms, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that actually exacerbates the, the lowering of the platelets necessarily, um, but that is a great question. Um, but if your doctor is recommending um, a baby aspirin a day for heart disease prevention, or mm -hmm. if you if you have known heart disease, it it probably depends on how at high risk you are for a snake bite. Uh, you know, as a as a compelling uh, uh, thought process. But probably the heart disease is probably what you know. Like you said there earlier in the slide, fatalities are very mm -hmm. rare. But the wow. number one killer of 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 us in the in the first world population is heart disease. So. Mm -hmm. But the other question. question that that came out um, was about immediately after, should you treat with any um, over-the-counter pain medications to treat the, the bite or the sting? And um, if you if you would recommend, would you recommend a NACID over um, acetaminophen? Um, I, I would probably hold off if at all possible. Um, you know, I think there's pluses and minuses to either one, but... Um, you know, I would really probably recommend holding off. That way you're not masking any symptoms or you have any um, potential side effects, um, like if it hits your liver or, you know, gastrointestinal tract, things like that. So probably hold off mm -hmm. if, if at all possible. Yeah. And then um, it looks like Richard Blight was asking, do you know if the venom would move through the vascular or the limbic system or both? Um, yeah, I think both the... Um, you know, the, the, the lymphatic system is really, um, I don't think a lot of people know about the lymphatic system, but that's really how we get a lot of passive fluid um, through our um, uh, immune system, but it's a massive way of fluid. Um, we, you know, we usually just think of the veins bringing, uh, the venous system bringing back blood flow, but it, it probably flows through both systems. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about then what to do or when it is, where and when it is that you, you would seek treatment. And then we'll get into some of these myths because I think that ties in a lot with some of the questions about the tourniquets mm -hmm. and anti-venom and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, Dr. You, you know, want to start with snake bites? I didn't hear you. Holly, did you call on me or Dara? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start with, with the sure. snake bites and then we yeah. can get into spider bites? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think... Um, I think a, kind of an exclusion principle applies here, unless you're extremely knowledgeable or you're with someone who's like really an authority about <laughs> that snake is definitely not a venomous snake. You, you really have to have this kind of a defensive posture of seeking care um, because again, it, it, it can be 
become very nuanced for those who are not experienced um, and even those who are potentially. And so really, you know, I would recommend to, to engage the emergency management um, department, um, whether it's through 911 or, you know, through an emergent, actually going to the emergency department and really the, um, the emergency room that's local to you is going to be very poised at potentially knowing the most common risks out there and then they can determine quickly if anti-venom is needed. And so um, I think, again, if unless you're strongly with someone who's an authority or if you're an authority, but um, uh, again, I, I think that's probably the rare case um, in most um, things, you know, because symptoms can develop quickly and, um, you know, the neurotoxins can really, you know, affect your ability to, to you know, move, talk, um, but, ten, but but potentially even your diaphragm for breathing. So, it, you know, it, it can be quite scary. Um, and then lastly, you know, even non-venomous bites, um, if it's dirty, um, you know, you can get infection and, and um, you know, you may even consider getting a tetanus booster from even a non-venomous bite. Yeah, good point. Um we may cover this later on, but but Dr. Cherry, one of the, the most frequently asked questions that we get every single year is which facilities have antivenom in case one of their employees mm. is bitten by a snake. What do you tell them? The shiniest ones. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is um, that's, that's a great question, so I'm glad you reminded me to address it. And so um, most antivenom is going to be centrally located. So it's not going to be at a specific hospital. It's going to be centrally located for a bunch of hospitals. So go to the closest emergency room. That way you can be quickly triaged and dispositioned, and then they can work on the logistics of getting the antivenom. You know, if you're going to jump, you know, if, if, if a smaller ER is closer, you know, you may just be wasting time if you drive past it to go to the large ER. So, um, you know, um, and then, you know, potentially the, the ER closest to where you got bitten at may actually have the best insight into, um, you, you know, what kind of snake it is potentially. So, but that's, yeah, that's a great question, Holly. Thanks for reminding me. Excellent point. Yeah. So don't pass up your closest ER to go to a larger ER thinking that you're going to get in a venom in a different place because they all share that from the same same place. And if you think a lot about it, it makes sense that that's expensive. Um, it's an expensive medication that has very um, specific storage regulations. Mm -hmm. And so we have to they have to keep that um, keep that there. So that's why you want it in a central location. Good deal. Dara, talk to us about spider bites. Yeah, I just want to hit on this last point one more time because I think we had the question in the chat too. Even non-venomous snake bites are at risk for infection. Somebody yes. asked if um, bacterial infections or other um, infections in snake bites were a concern, and I think they are definitely a concern. So even if it's non-venomous, you need to make sure you're managing the wound appropriately and taking care of the wound um, because there is that risk of infection um, yes. on either type of bite. So absolutely. Um, spider bites. So there's a couple of the different common ones here. Um, you you could see skin rash with the brown recluse bites, purple blue areas with a red ring. Um, you could get some body aches and pains. Um, you also with brown recluse uh, with very severe, you could end up with fever and chills and blood. Um, Black widow as you've got some similar um, skin reactions. You got potential abdominal cramps and muscle spasm and pain. Um, I, I do think just like with snake bites, don't wait to seek treatment if you're concerned or you have underlying conditions that you might be worried about. I, I do think um, even though we know that these are not fatal necessarily, um, you want to be able to manage the symptoms and you know even if you are um, doing okay. You just want to make sure that you've got um, support medically and that you, um, again, especially if you have underlying conditions that could complicate the mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. or, um, you know, what you see often is very young or very old um, individuals are the ones that are most affected by these types of stings and bites um, mm -hmm. because of um, their ability to manage the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so just, if you're ever in question about when and where to seek treatment, just like with snake bites, don't try to find somebody that's an expert in this. Just get get support medically. Mm -hmm. Scott, anything yeah, just a additional of, there? Yeah, um, a couple of um, 
you know, in medicine, like we're always working at like a, a differential diagnosis, like, okay, someone presents with these symptoms, what could it be? And so um, what's interesting from a surgical perspective is um, uh, a, a lot of times people come to the ER with just really severe abdominal pain. And um, if there really can be no, no real uh, um, clear reason what's going on, sometimes they'll go to surgery just for an exploratory um, abdominal surgery just to see what's going on. And so uh, black widow spider bites have actually caused people to go in for those types of surgeries. That's how strong of um, abdominal pain uh, these bites can, can cause. So that's definitely a, a, an important type of history that it may not be apparent. So these spider bites aren't going to be on your abdomen or on your stomach. They're going to be potentially anywhere but they do, because of that uh, venom, they, it can travel throughout the body and cause really what we call almost a surgical abdomen. And so that's really important to give that information to the ER. Um, and then with brown recluse bites, um, I'm actually aware of like a, a military um, case where a, a young soldier in boot camp was bitten and then the venom went to um, his lower leg uh, where the shin bone is and actually caused what they call a compartment syndrome where there was so much pressure from the venom that there was loss of blood flow to the area. So he actually had to get a surgery to, to allow that pressure to open up. And he actually lost some of the muscle in front of his leg and it, it was actually career limiting. So um, obviously these are severe examples, but it, it does happen. I've never forgotten that from over 20 years ago. So. Um, definitely something that you want to be, uh, well, what we call here is like it's a, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So, um, yeah. if you go to the ER and it's a nothing burger, then yeah, it was a little bit inconvenient for maybe everybody, but at least you have that reassurance. But the flip side happens if you wait five or six hours and then something is really swelling or you have severe symptoms that can, you know, and that's especially in the work-related setting, right? Like we, we want to prevent, the, we want the best outcome possible. So the, the early treatment is really key here, which is kind of the, probably the number one commandment for our incident case management model. Right. Yeah. yeah and um, I, I do think, you know, unlike snake bites, they're not going to administer antivenom for a spider bite, but that wound care is critical. And yeah. I, I think that that's where, you know, although it's not fatal or you're not gonna be dealing with some of the mm -hmm. same symptoms, it's that actual wound that can cause some major damage to the body mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. tissue healing. Um, mm -hmm. We had a, a quick question here from Mark Scott. Um, if you mischaracterize a spider as being a black widow, but it actually wasn't, is there any danger in being given treatment for a black widow? Um, I don't think so. I, 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 only if the rare case that you actually had a surgical, surgical abdomen and you said you had a black widow and, and people are, in it, but you know, like if it was your appendix, then, you know, that's easily found through imaging. But say you had something that's just really sneaky that, that eludes uh, imaging and a good physical exam. But I don't think so. I, I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case, but you, you never know. But, you know, you want to be as, um, forthcoming as possible. But um, again, Black Widow or, you know, if you're talking to an ER provider, they're going to, if you tell them a spider bite, they know 100% you may be off potentially yeah. unless you come with that like 100% credibility, which, um, you know, is kind of rare. So. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Cherry, before we move on to the to the myths, which are next, there was something that we talked about a point and I saw that there was a question about hypertensive crisis. And so I was going to ask you, could you identify, we talk a lot about um, um, extenuating circumstances or, or other outside factors, you know, of like uh, mm -hmm. medical problems that you may experience. Could you talk about what those other factors would be that we're that we're referencing here? You know, so. Um... I think if you have any chronic medical conditions or comorbidities, it's even more important to get checked out. Um, you know, our, our, our if we look at a pop, at, at a population health level of America, like we are seeing adults, even young adults, that are carrying one, two, three uh, chronic medical conditions even at a young age, and so 
that just makes you further, um, you know, say you have early heart disease and you're, you know, bitten by a snake with a, um, any one of the toxins, um, you know, that can put higher demand on your cardiovascular system. So it can, you know, it can set that off. If you mm -hmm. have uh, diabetes, that definitely creates issues with wound healing and you're set up for um, a much worse infection. Um, and, and so uh, those are usually the, the two big chronic medical issues. But um, we talked about high blood pressure. So like if you're if you run kind of like stage two or three high blood pressure already, um, and then you have something very anxious hitting you, and then you do have a, an envenomation, you could have a hypertensive crisis, which essentially is like really bad symptoms with your high blood pressure that, you know, is, um, you know, pretty scary. So, you, you, you know, um, again, if you're totally healthy, it's probably still reasonable to get fully checked out. But um, if you're, if you have medical conditions, or if you don't know, if you haven't been, even yeah. if you haven't been to a physical for a year, or if you're a man, probably, uh, I'll just talk about me. If I haven't been in, in many years, you know, you, you, you might, the, the probability you may have something going on as a chronic medical condition already, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think Jamie had asked specifically, but can the venom itself lead to a hypertensive crisis? Do you know that? Um, I, I, I wouldn't know that specifically. Um, I would have to look that up. Yeah. And I would think it would matter on what, you know, everybody's body reacts differently to some of those. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, this is actually, I, it's kind of a, I hate to say it's my favorite one, but it's my favorite one and what we talk about on, on some of the things that, that go around. So let's get started with some of the myths then that, that, that you hear about mm -hmm. that um, you may frequently hear, but that doesn't mean it's the right choice of, of what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So um, Dara, do you want to, you and Scott, let's see, either one of you can take, one, take these, but let's talk about the, I think it's Scott, uh, about the different myths that we need to avoid whenever we're dealing with, with either types of bites. Maybe next year we'll just do true or false for a polling and we'll, we'll get to share the, share the results. Cool. Everyone yeah. now will already know the answers, but you know, yeah. a year is a long time away from now. But um, right. you know, I think the movies and pop culture kind of teach us this uh, subconsciously. Um, and it almost makes common sense, right? Like, um, so it's all dangerous, right? Um, but. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want to put a tourniquet, right? Like that, that I think I, I saw that, I was educated that when I was like five or six with Indiana Jones or some it looks movie. Cool. But, it looks cool in the movies, yeah. Yeah, um, but you know, in many ways, you, you really don't want to do many things to the wound except good wound care and staying calm. So, um, you know, specifically here, you do not want to put a tourniquet around the wound. Um, there's a lot of reasons. You, you um, you can have it too soft, you know, too soft, too uh, hard, and so you're affecting um, venous or arterial blood flow, um, and so that's it's just really tricky. The the main thing is you do have, you know, you do have time necessarily in general, unless it's very you're, you're in very austere remote conditions. But usually, if snake bites are a risk, then you will have already kind of a prepackaged plan for that to. Um, and then also you do not want to apply ice or heat because again, that's going to kind of change um, the blood flow dynamics as well. Um, you know, and I think again, sucking the venom out, I think that's what reminded me of the Indiana Jones movie, actually not the tourniquet um, yeah. or maybe a Tarzan movie or something, but um, you know, really you don't want to do any further damage to the tissues. That's, that will kind of make things worse, especially if you're not trained. Um, and then, oh yes, this is kind of addressing that question you had, uh, Holly, about the the lo the, the, the um, central location of the anti venom. So you know, you want to stay, you want to go to your lo your closest um, emergency department. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and then the lastly, yes, so you know, do not bring the live snake to the emergency department. So that that's must have happened many many times, I guess. <laughs> I know I've seen it. I'm sure you did whenever you were in practice as well. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of questions about snake kits, um, about recommend, are they recommended? Would you think that they're mm -hmm. of any value? They're on a work site. What are your thoughts about some of these, these kits? 
you know, I think absent, just like what I said, being very, very remote and um, austere, remote, um, you know, hours and hours away. Um, you know, we used to support um, like remote islands that would take like a helicopter only or a boat. Like, you know, it would be, you know, just very, very remote conditions. You would, you should have kind of a very, a most probable cause plan for, for things that are kind of, um, expected but in general really you just want to do conservative treatment of good wound care stay calm and then engage um calmly into the emergency uh, medical department system agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. dare talk, talk to us about how we can avoid some of these creepy critters yeah i, I mean scott's already mentioned prevention oh. is the key here right we want to mm -hmm. prevent the um the bites from happening first. And if we do get bitten, we wanna have a plan for that. So um, be vigilant in your storage spaces, anything that could be a hiding spot for these types of creatures, make sure that you're, you're paying attention to that. Um, if you do have things that are stored, uh, inspect those items before, uh, I know Scott just mentioned being in the military. I know anybody who is in the military shakes out their boots before they ever put their <laughs> boots on. Um, it's a practice that I see in, in my husband and other people that I know are ex-military, they're, they're always making sure that they, they shake those boots out um, just in case something's hiding in there. So make sure you do that on a regular basis. Um, if you're out and about, those tall grass areas or firewood stacks are perfect hiding, perfect hiding spots for both of these types of creatures. Um, so make sure that you're avoiding those or if you're in them for work or you know you're you're kind of around those areas just pay attention to what's in there sometimes it's really hard to see the snake in those areas because they blend in they camouflage really really well um and i know in our area in the houston area some of the snakes are very well camouflaged so it takes quite a bit to spot them um use buddy system for surveillance if you're out in the field if you've got a team make sure you're paying attention if you're out in high grasses or in different areas, make sure that everybody's kind of uh, avoiding and paying attention and surveying the area. Um, I I know it's counterintuitive, and especially in Texas when you're out and it's <laughs> 105 outside, but wearing long pants, good boots, um, those are really great practices. If you're out hiking around and a snake bites you, um, and it but it bites you on the side of your boot, that's much better than biting you on your leg. Um, and if you do happen to see a spider or a snake, just avoid it. Don't try to kill it. Don't try to go after it. Um, just try to avoid it if at all possible and, and not um, and not try to engage with the creature. Uh, and like Scott said, one of the challenges with um, with the way things have been going is that we, we are coming across them more and more. Um, we're in some of these locations that are becoming more populated. So just be aware of what's in your area or if you're working out in the field, um, make sure you take these precautions. Um, also, like Scott said, make sure you have the plan before the bite or the sting occurs. Um, make sure that you know what the plan is. I know all of you in safety and in, in the, this area already have your plans and are ready to go if something does happen. Um, and those of you that are Axiom clients, your plan is to call Axiom and help yeah. let us help you figure mm -hmm. all this out. So mm -hmm. anything else, Dr. Cherry? No, I think you covered it very well. Yeah. Uh, Dara, there was another one, good one that was on here from Kevin and said, also check your gloves before you put them on. So mm. yes, yeah, so it's not just shaking off boots, it's the gloves as well. That's an excellent point. And also Lori, you're exactly right. Lori was talking about her, her career um, and being in rural areas and was talking about that, um, whenever she was an EMS, that, that if there was a patient that they needed to, that was bitten, that needed that, and it was in a rural area that they didn't have it, they would fly them to, a, to another location. You're exactly right, Lori. And, and that's why we want them to go to the, you know, to a facility and they can make that decision if it's, if it's warranted for sure. Absolutely. Oh, Holly, I missed, I missed one tip and all Which that is? too. Um, humans aren't the preferred prey in, in these scenarios. Ooh, so, you know, uh, just avoid them if you yeah. can. Um, if we step in, if we step on them or if we engage, usually that's when something happens. Um, yeah. They would prefer to leave us alone just as much as we'd prefer to leave them alone. And I love the idea of shaking out the gloves too. I, I've heard a lot of cases lately 
of people getting spider bites um, while taking out the trash. So even though you may be good about Ooh. keeping your garage area clean and, and things like that, I've heard of a, uh, quite a few people that have put their hands on the trash can to move the trash out to the street and didn't realize there were spiders kind of tucked in there. Ooh, so just, I uh, yeah, know it's just, we, we get into our daily habits and kind of forget about these things, mm -hmm. um, but take an extra mm -hmm. second to try to shake those spiders loose if you happen to be taking out the trash. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Sherry, you've had a lot of questions about venom extractors. You feel the same about venom extractors that you do about the snake bite kits, correct? Say that. The yes, I do. Yes. About snake, uh, about extractors. Yeah. All yeah. right. All right. Quickly talk, talk to us about some of these ticks because I understand that this can have some long-term outcomes, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think at first it feels a little bit underwhelming, the, t the tick bite topic, but actually as I think about it, it it's actually... I think at least important to address and discuss. Um, so just like any other wound, you do want to do um, really good wound care. Obviously with a tick bite, usually the tick is still in you. And so removal is really um, doing a, a good technique is, is critical. So you don't want to grab, you want to, you want to use tweezers if at all possible and grab as close to your skin as possible and, and try not to like, crush the tick while you're pulling it out you want to it's kind of like this <laughs> if, if you've done a couple i think you're you know you, you get you get practice but it's a balance of holding traction but not letting it slip and not letting it crush um and um you know i think what's more important though is um the long-term risk like you talked about holly um I think a lot of people know about Lyme disease, or at least it, it sounds familiar. So Lyme disease is a, a bacterial infection um, that was discovered in Lyme, Connecticut. So, you, you know, when I was in med school in Florida, it was like, oh, I don't have to deal with Lyme disease. <laughs> That's in the Northeast, but it, it's still like the most prevalent is the Northeast around Connecticut and in all those Northeastern states. But it does look like it's starting to kind of uh, come across a lot of North America in general. Um, but um, it has a, a famous uh, kind of, once you're bitten, it has like a bullseye target um, where you have like different rings of discoloration. And so that's classic Lyme, but a lot of Lyme disease is very subtle and underdiagnosed. Um, so I think we'll talk about Lyme disease as really the big one, but there's, there's like, so many, there's like probably dozens of tick-borne illnesses and it's 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 every flavor it's bacteria it's parasite and it's uh, viral and so um you you know for me just thinking about it, i do not want to be bitten by a tick at all um what's interesting though with like lyme disease specifically is um uh it needs to be a, a tick that's very young and then it needs to be attached for like quite a long time like like over a day. And so uh, to actually uh, have you at risk for getting Lyme disease, but you can actually get easy prophylaxis. Luckily it's a bacteria, so there's easy prophylaxis. Um, but again, you, you, you do, I think the prevention method is if you're going into a wooded area and you're heavily clothed, you know, you wanna check yourself uh, frequently or at least at the end of each day that way you know or whether or not you have ticks. But I've heard of them like in the scalp and they're in occult places where they're hiding out. But there's so many different illnesses associated with ticks. Like you really wanna, like fortunately I don't deal with ticks for myself anymore, but if you're like a hunter or a soldier or some kind of adventure person, like the ticks are out there, I think. I think they're magnets military for kids. Thing. Yeah. yeah, and kids, dogs, all the things. Yeah, um, you know, tick check is you know got to make sure your friends don't come home with ticks. Yeah. yeah, we had somebody. Let's see, there was somebody that put a a really good recommendation and said that it was really good for really easy to pull ticks out with those. It was some kind of device. Yeah, it's called Tick um, Key. He said Mike had said hmm. it was called Tick Key. It was a great great tool for removing ticks. So if you don't have those needle nose uh, needle nose tweezers, there absolutely that may be something to check out. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's talk scorpions. Ooh, I hate just looking at them. Um, Dara, I'm going to let you take this one away because I think that your story probably says it all. 
Yeah, I'll talk to you a little bit about my story. I, I can be an example of what not to do. Um, I was uh, in Mexico and thinking about everything but scorpions. I was thinking about uh, West Nile at the time and Zika and all sorts of other uh, mosquito-borne illnesses, which we haven't even gotten into. Um, <laughs> another one that feels underwhelming, talking about ticks and mosquitoes after talking about snakes feels like they're, <laughs> we shouldn't be talking about them, but they really do carry their own host of real problems and they're changing. The regions are really changing pretty drastically um, over the last few years. But I was um, at a, an event in Mexico and felt a sting on my toe and thought it was a bee or wasp sting and started having symptoms almost immediately of um, feeling like I was having an anaphylactic reaction and thinking to myself, I've never had allergic reaction to a bee or wasp sting, didn't see anything, couldn't see a, a scorpion, couldn't see any sort of thing that would have stung me, no stinger in my, it was in my toe and then in my left thigh. And um, we ended up in the emergency room, but because I didn't know what stung me, um, it ended up, we couldn't use any antivenom or anything because we didn't know what it was. But I ended up with um, full head to toe nerve symptoms in terms of it felt like uh, nerve ending tingles, uh, lost vision, lost the ability to walk. And I know Dr. Cherry's comment about, you know, panicking and it felt like I was losing the ability to breathe. Um, mm. My pulse ox and my oxygen levels were actually okay, but it felt like because of the venom or whatever was in me that I couldn't breathe and that my heart was racing. Um, it was one of the absolute worst feelings I've ever had. I, I, um, I remember coming back and talking to my colleagues at Axiom and saying, I know we've had a lot of employees with scorpion stings before. Um, I now have so much empathy for that experience because at the end of the story, the, the punchline is while packing for Houston to come home the next day, we shook out my dress and we found the scorpion inside my dress still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very tiny little scorpion that did all that damage. Um, it took about seven days for symptoms to fully reside. Um, but because I ended up, my oxygen levels were fine. It, you know, didn't, obviously it wasn't fatal. I'm still here today, but the symptoms were very, very difficult to deal with. And there really wasn't much to do in terms of treatment of those symptoms. So luckily in the U S we don't have that many with that level of toxin. Um, and when you get stung, it hurts, but it doesn't really cause those types of symptoms. Um, usually it's localized pain like any bee sting or, or wasp sting would be. And you would see normally some redness some swelling. Um, this was definitely more of the severe reaction to the, the venom. And, um, I really struggled. And so, uh, it was the, probably the type of toxin and, my reaction to it. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot to do other than like it says, like Dr. Cherry said, if I, you know, stay calm and, um, continue to just manage the reaction and the symptoms, that's about all I could really do. Um, once I knew I wasn't going to die, it helped me stay calm <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and I, I think if it ever happened again, I would definitely be much more calm than I would have at the time in, in a rural town in Mexico. Um, dealing with Ooh. the uh, medical system at that point. But my, my doctor was phenomenal and I, his name is Dr. Colorado and he, I'll never forget him. He was incredible. So, um, that's the story and I will forever have empathy and, and tons of sympathy for anybody stung by something that they have a reaction like that too. Yeah. So general first aid measures then Dr. Cherry, um, if you have a scorpion sting, what would you recommend? If you were not having a severe reaction. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, just like any other wound still, just wash it with soap and water. Um, if it's a limb, if you can keep it elevated um, and stay calm, try to get a picture of it. Or if you end up, you know, killing it, bring it with you. Um, probably just kill it and then take a picture. But um, uh, really, it's just basic kind of uh, wound, wound care. And, um, you know, in, in, in North America, really, we have one venomous uh, scorpion called a, a bark scorpion. Um, but, but still, like, it's, it's um, uh, they can be sneaky. They're kind of usually stuck up under rocks or in crevices. Um, uh, 
you know, if you're traveling, it, it does sound like that's like high risk or camping, things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, sometimes it's, it's interesting because like symptoms can actually be delayed too. So you can be stung and then it, it's a few hours later, but they do have potentially that neurotoxic um, venom, which I guess it's hard to, I mean, obviously you experienced it, Dara, so it, it's like, it's too real for you, but like just hearing about it <laughs> academically or theoretically, it, it sounds like, oh yeah, neurotoxin, but it's, it, it's like, it's like you worked out as much as you can. And, and, and as you get fatigued, it's like, that's, that's your, your body saying you can't, your muscles won't respond to your brain commands. So the, mm-hmm. the toxin literally like poisons the ability for the nerves to convey your, des- you know, your, <laughs> your your commands from the brain your central nervous system to the to the actual uh, motor complex in your muscles so if it's your diaphragm that's pr- you know pretty pretty scary but again if it's your eyes you have blurry vision or you're slurring your speech or mm-hmm. your your fine motor control goes if say you're riding a motorcycle and you need to be able to you know deal with those types of things you know or you know any kind of other uh you know um safety sensitive activity you know yeah 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 it's 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 scary for sure and i I think somebody asked how many we i think we have 90 species of scorpions in the u.s and like you said maybe one is that toxic yeah um i know holly's had some personal upfront encounters with scorpions recently in texas up in her area we have, Holly. yeah. I feel like every every time I turn around, yeah, in, including just this last week, we we're on the way to the airport, and all of a sudden, I looked down. I was putting makeup on. I was making my husband drive, and so, anyways, I looked down and I saw the biggest scorpion I've ever seen. And so, I'm like having to like you know like scoop it up in my hat and try to throw him out the window. It was a lot. Mm. I, I, I told Todd, I don't even know if I can drive this car anymore. <laughs> She's gonna get a new car and burn down the old one. So. I think I think that's the preventative, uh, right? There you go. That's what that's what totally that's preventative. Yeah, uh, hmm. we have had a lot of questions about pets, Dr. Cherry, um, and so hmm. one in particular was if a snake or a spider bites your pet. Obviously, we need to take take them to the emergency room. But what could you do to immediately calm them down? Hmm. No, you're not a veterinarian. Yeah, I don't <laughs> but... know. Uh, well, what what made me think for a second was when I lived in. Um, west texas for a while like i I came across i think there's a vaccine for um snake bites for dogs i think oh so yeah because i was like hey why don't we have that for humans um (laughs) but that yeah if you you know if you have an outdoor dog or a dog that you take hunting or you know is that at more risk um you know i think when i lived out in new mexico it was uh um a lot of people would hike with their dogs and so they might get yeah. bitten in the desert, but I think there's a vaccine or at least I saw an advertisement for it. Um, so that's something to consider and that'll keep you calmer, calmer if uh, your dog does get bitten, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I don't know with the pets is, and so would you, I guess that you would just contact your vet and then you obviously wouldn't take them to the yes. ER. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's, you know, there's vet clinics and then there's vet ER. So you, you probably want to go to a vet ER um, unless you know your your veterinarian can handle a, a snake bite. So, you know, ask your vet. We had vet. somebody in the audience confirm about the rattlesnake vaccine, Scott. So there is a rattlesnake yeah. vaccine, yeah. she said. Yeah, yeah. She said there was one for dogs, yeah. And then I think probably um, Anita Wilson had the best comment that said, so what do we do so that we can sleep tonight? Glad this was an afternoon session. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're sorry, yeah. Athena. Um, sorry, Athena. We're yeah. sorry. Sock over your shoe, cover, yeah. oh, your shoe openings, yeah. you know. Yeah. Jenny was Just mentioning that her as dog, much as possible. That's right. Jenny said her dog was bitten uh, by a copperhead in the vet, had them give Benadryl NSAIDs and oral steroids and then good wound care. So yeah, all mm. of those make a lot of sense. Yeah. Wow. A lot going on here. We have so many questions. I think this may be the most, um, most mm. questions asked webinar. So we may have to put together a live stream for this next week. Cause I, I don't think there's any way in the world that we can get to all of these. Um, any, any closing thoughts before we wrap up here? By either one of you? Not for me. I think we, we covered everything I wanted to talk about. 
such a deal. Yeah, for me, Derek, it's just, it's the it's the it's those little things. You know, like I said, we kind of ended with the little ones. This the, yeah. I know we talked about scorpions, but it's the mosquitoes and the ticks and those things that are are bearing some some pretty major illnesses. So mm-hmm. just try to prevent as much as you can. Um, it's healthy to be outside. It's good to be out in the woods, but try to do whatever you can to prevent those bites and stings and stay safe. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for attending again. If you haven't already, please make for sure that you click that that register now button that's at the top right hand side of your screen that will get you registered for next month whenever we talk about migraine disease. And then also we will send out a communication on what it is that we can put a live stream together so that we can go through the rest of your questions. So thank you again for attending. You guys did a great job. You're a great audience and, and expect some love notes and some gifts in the mail. Thank you so much.